And here you'll see the westernized dragon, a symbol of great strength but also formidable evil. Knights would come from miles around to slay the beasts, but very few would succeed against this mighty foe. Ahem. <clears throat> Question. <sighs> yes. Yeah, if these things are so powerful that hundreds would die, why didn't they just try to tame the dragons to conquer everything? Well, in East Asian cultures, dragons were often depicted helping to fight off evil armies. Although, they often just gave strength to the righteous. They weren't exactly fighting people themselves. And besides, I'm not sure having a giant lizard stomping around and breathing fire everywhere is gonna be the best tactical decision. But actually, it worked really well in this game right here, so yeah, you're wrong. <sighs> Hello internet, welcome to Game Theory, where normally I'd be ready to present all my scientific evidence and deep research about a new and exciting franchise, but just haven't been able to make it happen this week. Sorry guys, couldn't do it, I've been spending too much time playing this new mobile game, it's literally all I've been able to think about over the last week. You know, I guess uh, no episode today. Wait, what? They're sponsoring this episode? I can do an episode based entirely on their immersive and diverse fantasy world, and my entire week of binging this game wouldn't have been for waste. Oh, multitasking for the win! Optimize the life score! All that being said, then this episode is sponsored by Call of Dragons, an MMO fantasy conquest game set in the mystical realm of Tamaris, a world that faces complete destruction since the heavens fell, releasing a new race of evil known as the Darklings. It's now up to us to bring together the once warring factions of the realm in order to fight off the massive threats. And I do mean massive, because while you set out to explore this vast land full of volcanic wastelands, lush forests, and icy tundras, you might come across giant monsters known as behemoths. These things tower above everything in the game, and take a heck of a lot to take down. They vary from giant bears, to lightning fast thunder rocks, to the titular dragons. You might be a mystical elf or an overpowered orc, but that won't be enough to take down these massive monsters. You have to form alliances with your fellow players if you want to succeed. And if you do succeed, you get yourself more than just the bragging rights of, oh, I took down a freaking dragon. The behemoth will actually join your alliance, helping you to clear the path with its flame breath or destroying a massive group all at once with their incredible strength. And I gotta say it feels pretty cool to roll up with the bear the size of Godzilla behind you. I have loved using all these awesome creatures inspired by mythology and history to decimate my enemies. It is like the most epic game of Pokemon ever, but it does take a lot of hard work to try and get all of the behemoths. And while I certainly love that style of game, I can't always spend a week binging and then claiming it as research. So I started to wonder, if I were to focus my efforts on just getting one epic massive behemoth beast, which one would be the best. If this were in fact a real army using real resources, which one would be giving me the most benefits and the fewest drawbacks? Using a combination of history and science, could I possibly figure out which of these big beasties would be my best buddy in the long run? Grab yourselves a staff and a bow, theorists, cause it's time to hunt ourselves a theory. And this one's a biggin. Let's start by deciding which behemoths are gonna be used in our little experiment, cause let's face it, if I did this with every single one that exists, this would be an hour long video. Instead, I'm just gonna narrow our choices down to three. Three, and they're actually the three that I mentioned earlier. The giant bear, the thunder rock, and the dragon. All three of them are currently available in the game, but they also represent three core animal groups, mammals, birds, and reptiles. This should mean that the majority of the tests that we do today could then be applied to other behemoths in the game. A giant bear is probably gonna fare very similarly to a dire bear, and a hydra would likely be similar to a dragon. So today we're just gonna stick to those, but who knows? Maybe if enough people subscribe to the game, we're gonna be able to do a follow-up video where we talk about some other of the behemoths. Also, I just just want to make it clear at the top here, this doesn't have anything to do with the actual stats or abilities of the characters in the game. This is just a fun thought experiment saying, hey, if there were giant eagles and lizards and bears running around the world, like, which one would I want as my personal pet? A man's gotta know. Alright, so with all that being said, let's begin. First of all, is it even realistic to use a giant creature in battle? Aren't they just gonna stomp over all your troops or burn them all with their fire breath? Well, you'd think so, but we as humans are a determined bunch, and we've actually utilized weird and wonderful creatures throughout history. Case in point, in the second century BC, there was a Carthaginian general named Hannibal. Uh, hello, Clary. Not that Hannibal. This one was famous for taking North African elephants over the Italian Alps to fight the Romans. I don't think I need to point out that elephants are not suited to narrow alpine paths, so why bother through all the hassle of bringing them in the first place? Morale. Well, the image of an elephant is certainly familiar to all of us today, for most 2nd century BC Italians, they knew nothing about these creatures. And if you see some that you don't recognize, well, that is gonna be scary. As one Roman historian Livy put it, quote, Moreover, the elephants, towering aloft at the ends of the line, terrified 
terrified the horses not only by their appearance, but by their unaccustomed smell and created widespread panic. I think it's safe to say all of our potentials would do that job. Sure, a bear is a little more normal looking than a freaking dragon, but if a bear the size of King Kong showed up at your door, I think you might be having yourself a bad time. But while elephants are certainly real life behemoths that were captured and trained for war, are you able to do the same thing for a giant bear, a thunder rock, or a dragon? If we don't take into account their sizes and instead look at them for what they really are, mammals, birds, and reptiles, suddenly we start to see that turning these guys from foes to friends might be a bit complicated. Let's start with the giant bear, shall we? You may have seen bears tamed throughout history. They were trained to dance in circuses, there are TikToks of people playing with bears, even one family in Russia keeps a bear as a pet, so you'd be thinking that this is clearly possible for our giant bears today, except you wouldn't be considering the whole story there. The most effective way to tame bears is to start their training when they're just a cub. That's what that family in Russia did. They adopted the cub when he was three months old, which meant that he grew up around humans. He grew up with them providing his food, and now he's docile towards them. But in Call of Dragons, though, we're not talking about just a bear cub. We're talking about a fully grown monster when we decide to fight it. Circuses were known to train adult bears, but the risks involved were incredibly high. They were tamed mainly using fear and pain to punish the animal, which I suppose we've done just by destroying it in battle, but it doesn't feel like the steadiest of alliances, does it? It would just take one bad day for it to turn on me and then wipe out my entire army. Maybe we'll have some better luck with the Thunder Rock. A rock is a creature from Middle Eastern mythology usually described as a giant form of eagle. And that's good news for us, as eagles can not only be tamed, but are specifically chosen to be trained once they turn to adults. In short, we haven't missed the training window for this one. Training an eagle is also much easier compared to other wild animals. Mainly, it just involves lots of talking to it, petting it, and then rewarding it with food when it completes a task. It's kind of like training a dog. The dragon, meanwhile, would be similar, as reptiles can also be bribed with food. However, unlike eagles, it's much harder to wean them off of this food-based reward system. According to Dr. Dinesh from Ron Hurst Animal Hospital in Philadelphia, reptiles can grow accustomed to an individual, but it's a different kind of bond than you might have with a domesticated animal like a dog or a cat. It's one of survival and habit rather than an actual special bond. Offer them food and they'll pretty much do whatever you want them to do, but it might start proving challenging to get your dragon to obey you without the promise of a snack afterwards. So technically, all of our options can in fact be trained, but one of them is definitely easier than all the others, which means that that is one point going to the Thunder Rock. So congratulations, you've now trained your behemoth with varying degrees of difficulty. It's time to take them into battle. You might think that this is all about strength or magical powers like breathing fire, but actually the biggest battle you'll have to overcome isn't one of strength, but rather a battle of the mind. The intelligence of these behemoths are going to play a huge role on the battlefield. Animals like horses, elks, and wolves, they all have handlers. They can literally be steered in whatever direction they need to go. The behemoths, though, they're riding solo. They don't have anyone steering them, so you need to be able to trust them to act somewhat autonomously, which requires a degree of intelligence beyond just simple taming. This should be an easy category, right? We literally use the terms bird brain and lizard brain as insults, but as you'd expect from this channel, things are never quite that simple. Bears are pretty smart. The U.S. Parks Department regularly struggles to find clever designs for their trash cans because, as one Yosemite park ranger put it, there is a considerable overlap between the intelligence of the smartest bears and the dumbest tourists. But the bear is by no means the smartest of our trio here. Some bird species can actually show incredible levels of intelligence. In fact, a Canterbury University study of a parrot-like bird native to New Zealand, the kia, was found to score higher in some levels of intelligence than a gibbon. But even the intelligence of the gibbon has its limits. For a long time, people believed that the larger an animal was relative to the size of its brain, the dumber that animal was. But that doesn't seem to tell the whole story. Dr. Susanna Herculano Huzel of Vanderbilt University has herself a theory. A scientific theory! She argues that the body size isn't actually important because it actually has to do with how densely packed the neurons in the brain are. That means that large creatures that we've previously considered to be rather unintelligent may in fact have been far smarter than we gave them credit for. Specifically, she calls attention to the Tyrannosaurus Rex, which she calculated would have had itself a neuronal density equal to that of a baboon, which would therefore put these giant lizards above both bears and gibbons on the intelligence food chain. This round seems to go to the dragon. But like I've said, these battles are battles of the mind, and one of the biggest things great tacticians have to bear in mind is location, location, location. Not every battle you're going to be having is going to be on your home turf. Sometimes you're just going to have to make your way into the unknown. Into the unknown! And if you take a look at the map of Tamaris, the unknown has itself a lot of variation. It's covered in forests, icy mountains, wastelands, basically every environment that you could possibly imagine, which makes for great gameplay, but ain't so great when you've got yourself a giant animal that's evolved specifically for a certain habitat. For example, reptiles are cold-blooded. They are gonna struggle in those icy mountains. 
Technically, they can survive colder climates by going through a process called diapause, which slows down all their body processes almost to a stop. While they certainly won't die, they're also not going to be fighting much. So the dragon, yeah, not super helpful in all those icy tundras. Fortunately, giant bears and thunder rocks are a lot more versatile. Brown bears and bald eagles have both been reported living in almost any environment, from the snowy plains of Alaska to the fringes of deserts in Arizona, which means that thunder rock gets itself another point, and the giant bear has made itself onto the board. Admittedly, I'm not sure either would be particularly happy about getting forced to fight in such harsh climates, but you gotta do what you gotta do to get some of that sweet, sweet reward food. Which actually brings me to my final point. Animals aren't cheap to look after. They require feeding just like any of our soldiers, but the amount they require can vary wildly from species to species. Bears typically need to eat around 16% of their body weight every single day. And while there's no official size for the giant bear in the game, we can get a pretty good idea of what a giant bear might look like thanks to our own history. Arctotherium and Gustadins was a huge prehistoric bear that grew up to 14 feet tall and weighed in at 4,000 pounds. 16% of 4,000 would mean it needs to consume 640 pounds of food every day in order to survive. If a normal livestock animal like a cow weighs roughly 1,400 pounds on average and 63% of that is actual edible meat, makes it about 882 pounds a day, that would mean that this giant bear eats one entire cow every one and a half days, which adds up to a lot of cows very quickly. That is 265 per year. I had hoped that the dragons would actually cost me a little less, as lizards are known to be great at conserving energy. One of the largest lizards in the world, the Komodo dragon, eats about 30% of its body weight in a single sitting. But the bonus is that it won't need to eat again for another month. It's a pretty good starting position, but our dragons are a little bit bigger, so how much food would they likely need? Unlike the bear, we actually get a shot of how big the dragon is. In the opening cutscene of the game, we can see the dragon standing in front of our heroes. Given Walder here in the middle is a human, we're gonna assume that he's the height of an average male, or 5 foot 9 inches tall. Using pixel measurements then, we can estimate that the dragon is about 13 feet tall. A Komodo dragon standing on four legs is about two feet, meaning this dragon is six and a half times bigger than the usual Komodo. So he just needs six and a half times the amount of food, right? Eh, not quite. Because thanks to the square cube law, his weight isn't actually six and a half times bigger, but six and a half to the third times bigger. If an average Komodo weighs 200 pounds, our dragon is clocking in at a hefty 54,925 pounds. Do not even get me started on whether this thing could fly. If it needs 30% of its body weight per month, that is 16,477 pounds every 30 days, roughly 18 and a half cows every month, which equates to one cow every two-ish days, which is just slightly more efficient than our giant bear. Something that I was absolutely not expecting. The winner of this round, though, is undoubtedly the Thunder Rock. While eagles certainly eat a lot, they're opportunistic eaters, meaning they can actually survive on a whole lot less. Bald eagles can weigh up to 14 pounds, but they only need to consume about one pound of food per day. That said, they can also stretch that limit. Bald eagles have something called a crop, which is an expandable part of their esophagus where they can store food. That one pound of food per day gets stored there so the eagle doesn't need to eat for another day or two. But just like with bears and dragons, the rock isn't the size of the normal eagle. The rock from mythology has actually been compared to the extinct Host's eagle, which could weigh in at a whopping 33 pounds and had a wingspan of 10 feet. That is pretty darn huge for a bird, but it's not big enough for our thunder rock. According to the thunder rock's in-game description, we see that this thing is large enough to blot out the sun. So that 10-foot wingspan, that ain't gonna cut it. What about something with a wingspan of 35 feet, though? That feels more like it. So allow me to introduce you to the pterosaurs. Pterosaurs only weighed in at about 500 pounds. So if this thing's like an eagle and only needs to eat 7% of its body weight every 72 hours, that means that the Thunder Rock is consuming 35 pounds every three days, or about 11 and a half pounds every day if you spread it out evenly. That is so much less than both the dragon and the giant bear that it's not even a competition. It would take roughly 76 days for this thing to consume one entire cow. Plus, eagles eat rotten meat, so you wouldn't even have to worry about preserving it. Meaning the winner of the round and the entire contest is the Thunder Rock. Its food efficiency and environmental adaptability make it the easiest choice. It's also easier to tame than the other two, and while it might not be the smartest, it's not that far off, which makes it the perfect companion to charge into battle. Personally, I expected the giant bear to do a bit better, considering it was the closest thing to animals that are still alive today, but then suddenly, my theorist light bulb went off.
myself, I didn't take into account one of the biggest issues facing these monsters. Humans. Us. It's all well and good figuring out which is the best choice for me, but I'm not the one trying to tame these behemoths. The world of Call of Dragons is full of other players, all of whom want a behemoth of their own, sometimes multiple. Sure, there's plenty to go around right now, but that's not always going to be the case long term. These creatures aren't being raised as pets, they're being actively trained for war. And war means casualties. If they die in a battle, you're going to have to find and train another one. There are over 150,000 people playing this game at the time of me writing this episode. And if they're all losing behemoths in battle regularly, well, we run the risk of just running out of behemoths entirely. Typically, you'll find that there are much fewer big animals out in the world than there are smaller ones. Major reason for that is that big animals have much longer gestation periods than small guys. The brown bear can give birth to one to three cubs every eight months, which isn't low enough to fear species extinction normally, but if you're losing a giant bear every few battles, all of which can happen over the course of weeks, that eight months isn't going to be short enough to keep up with the demand. Our giant bear is also much bigger than a normal bear, and bigger animals have lower birth rates. Elephants, for example, can only give birth to one calf every 22 months. Same goes for the dragon. While most reptiles lay a lot of eggs, larger reptiles like crocodiles and Komodo dragons will only do so once a year. And if we look even further back, scientists believe that some of the biggest dinosaurs, which would have been much closer to the size of our dragon, may have laid as little as one egg every year, which just isn't enough. What about our winner today, our shining beacon of hope, the Thunder Rock? Well, it too shares the same fate. The biggest bird egg on the planet is the ostrich egg, and a single ostrich can lay around 18 of them annually. Sounds pretty good. Once again, the amount of eggs laid per year goes down as the bird gets larger. If the bird is the size of a pterosaur, then there's a chance that it would lay eggs at a similar rate, only two per year. In summary, well, yes, some behemoths may be more beneficial to have as allies than others. Ultimately, none of it's going to matter in the long run, because humans are just going to doom them all to the same fate as the prehistoric giant animals of their past. They are going extinct, baby. I guess it goes to show that size sometimes doesn't matter. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. And thanks one final time to Call of Dragons for sponsoring today's episode. You guys know how much I love games that involve actually using your brain, rather than just mindless button mashing. Having to tactically consider not just which behemoth is best for my army, but everything else, like what faction is going to serve my playstyle best, what my playstyle even is, do I want to focus on magic or physical power? All of this stuff is perfect for me. And even though I'm normally more of an RPG guy, Call of Dragons even threw some of those elements in here too, allowing me to choose what heroes I upgrade and what skills I upgrade first. It's almost like this game was specifically built with me in mind. And this is literally just scratching the surface of all the awesome stuff that this game has to offer. It's got beautiful cinematics, it's got full voice acting, it's got epic music, and so much more. Sadly, I just can't sit here gushing over every single feature, so you're just gonna have to go and download the game for yourself to find out what else there is. So use the link in the description or snap the QR code that you see on screen right now to head on over to the app store of your choice and download the game on iOS, Android, or PC today. And while you're there, make sure you tell them that Game Theory sent you by using the code TGTPLAYCOD, which not only gets you a special bonus, but it also makes a massive difference for all of us here at Team Theorist. It means they get to see how awesome this community is, how active you guys are, how positive you are. It also means that they can then keep sponsoring us, which means I get to keep making great content for you. It is a win-win-win for everyone. So thank you to Call of Dragons for sponsoring this video, and thank you, as always, for watching. Remember to check out the link down in the description below, and as always, I'll see you next week.